everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is uh, Gita Crefield, and I'm the coach of Team Singapore. It's my pleasure to have you with me. And uh, this particular lecture is going to be on how you think about rebuttal and how you can work with table action in order to refine rebuttal. So I'm going to get going. I'm going to share some slides. And if you can't see the slides, do let me know. OK, uh, are the slides visible? Yes, all good. OK, good. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here with me. So as a coach, it's often a situation where speakers will ask, what do you do in rebuttal? How do you deal with rebuttal? And what is the function of rebuttal? And so I'm going to do two things for you today. I'm going to be talking about the idea of rebuttal. But along with that, I'm also dealing with the idea of intensifying table attack. That means not just about the idea of what do you do in the, with the rebuttal, but how do you use it on the table when you are a debater? What, what are the ways in which this particular rebuttal that you construct will become meaningful in the cause of the debate so that it gives you advantage? So let's have a look at that. So among the things that I'd like to talk to us about. One would be the idea. So this is uh, some pictures from uh, debating in Singapore. But one of the first things I'd like us to start with is the idea of what is layered rebuttal. So layering is not just about doing one rebuttal, but rather thinking of the rebuttal like a sandwich with many layers. And what you're going to do in the, with this sandwich is you're going to build it with care and precision. So what do we mean? What is to rebut? And I think we all know that to rebut means that you need to ensure that you are responding to whatever is happening in front of you, whatever arguments are coming from the other side. So rebuttal consists of the following possibilities. You are making the following attempts. First, when you rebut, what you're trying to do is you are trying to prove that the effects the other side attempts to achieve are better attained on your side. Now, this simply means what you're actually working towards is trying to make sure that you are clear and precise. And so you are clear and precise in such a way that you can take down the other side's claims that whatever is good for them is actually better on your side. So that's the first thing that rebuttal does. What is the second thing that rebuttal does? The second thing that rebuttal does is that what you are trying to do in rebuttal is you are trying to disprove. And you are trying to disprove the efficacy of the arguments from the other side. Now, what does that mean? So everybody in the course of a debate at one point or another is going to make some claim that whatever they are doing is better than whatever you plan to do, is better than whatever else you as the opponent are suggesting. So the nature of rebuttal is that what you can also do in rebuttal is that you can disprove this claim on the other side. Finally, what else is a rebuttal useful for? In world schools, rebuttal makes up that component, both in content and in strategy. It's because when you rebut well, the content mark is where part of the rebuttal acknowledgement takes place. But when you rebut, rebut correctly, pardon me, that and the ability to identify exactly what's going on in the debate is where you will get some strategic marks as well. So the other thing that you want to be able to do in a debate is that you want to be able to diminish and negate the significance of the arguments that are coming from the other side. This is super important. So you have multiple ways in which you can deal with the basics of rebuttal. You can either say that whatever results that they want are better on your side. You can disprove the efficacy of their arguments, both their principled and practical arguments. And then you can reduce or negate the significance that you see in front of you. Now, what types of rebuttals are there? The first I'd like us to think about when we're doing layered rebuttal is that the rebuttal that one side is attempting to do can be better done by the other side. So I'm going to get to examples in a moment. But the, what you're basically saying is if someone stands up and says, well, our case demonstrates the following will be best achieved, then when you get up, what you want to do is you want to remove that claim. You want to be able to say that whatever they claim, your side 
is going to be able to actualize it in a better way. You also want to be able to show in rebuttal sometimes that whatever the other side is claiming is actually a bad thing. So you can actually suggest and negate that the positive advantages that they claim or the positive outcomes that are being suggested are actually not true. And in fact, it's a negative that is going to be set into motion and that there is a negative outcome. And of course, there is the fact that you can also sideline what the other side is saying. And sidelining means that what you're actually trying to do in rebuttal is to reduce whatever the other side has as their main thrust. You're going to reduce that and try to make the effect marginal so that there is some space for this debate. So layering the debate is very much like generating arguments. So when you sit and you think together as a team with emotion in front of you, I'm sure you will think of lots of things. And some of your arguments will have multiple reasons, multiple ways in which you can actually finish the causal link of your argument. You know, you may end up saying that um, we would, for instance, give aid to developing nations with no conditions. And you might have multiple reasons why you would do that. So in a layered action for the rebuttal, just like for building case arguments, you wanna think for all the many ways in which something is untrue, so that what you end up with is multiple situations in which you can rebut the debate, arguments coming from the other side, so that there are ways in which you are not static. And I think that I want to make a, a big claim for all of us that you don't want to be static in a debate. That means in a debate, you don't want to just look as if you're saying the same thing again and again, and there's no variation to what you're saying, and that's quite important. But at the same time, I'd like to remind us that what we want to be able to do is never make sure that we contradict ourselves. So we must not contradict. So even when we are generating a whole set of examples for rebuttal or for a set of ideas for rebuttal, it is super important to bear in mind that you cannot contradict yourself because the moment you contradict yourself, then you are putting your own argument at risk your own rebuttal at risk, because this contradiction suggests that there is a weakness in the way that the team has perceived its own responsibility in the debate and that there is a problem in the logic that the team is generating. So let's just bear that in mind. Okay, so what we're going to do now is just look at a motion together. Now, this motion uh, was the WSDC 2020 motion. And the motion says, this house would pay additional benefits to families on welfare according to their performance in school. So I'm going to read that again and just say to all of us, just think about the motion for a couple of minutes, that this house will pay additional benefits to families on welfare according to their performance in school. So I was going to say, let's think for a moment, but I think by talking through the motion, we'll be able to get that think time. So first, obviously, this is about a particular manner by which you want to transform and uplift families on welfare. But this is a motion that's suggesting a particular new way of thinking of how the family can gain additional benefits. And the link is to the instrumentation of your performance in school, the child's performance in school. So you have the unit of the family, but you have the actor of the child, and, and then you have the actor, the states, trying to think about what to do. All right, so let's have a look at this motion. So if we have this motion, let's say the proposition says the thing, this argument to us. Passing the mo this particular motion would improve students' academic performance as this would incentivize students to do well. So what we have from proposition as a argument is that if we did what is suggested, we would get incentivization and students will therefore do better. And the argument is therefore uh, passing the motion improves the performance because of incentives, the, the, the benefits being the incentives. Okay, so if we think for a moment about this, so proposition has got this. Now, opposition needs to respond to this example. And we want to try and think in terms of layered rebuttal. What can we do in layered rebuttal? So here are some suggestions. First, opposition rebuttal could be 
this would place undue psychological stress on the child, worsening their performance in school. So what, what opposition is doing in this instance is coming straight out and going straight for the heart of the matter and saying, no, the child will have stress. And because the child has stress, this worsens performance in school. So that's layer one of the rebuttal. So you can do that. So this immediately gives uh, the other side a sense that you are coming straight out and you are offering a counterway in which to perceive whatever is being suggested about this. But can you stop there? We would su suggest, and I would suggest to you that you need to push further on and that layer rebuttal means you try to do something like this. You may say this will lead to students getting even um, fewer resources further hurting their performance in school. Now, why? Because if I have disincentivization, then there's fewer resources. So I'm building upon my first statement. I am not uh, just talking about the first one, which is on every child, but now I move into a second category, a second subset of the actor. And the actor now is not just every child, but the failing student. And I say, well, look, if you said that, as you did in proposition, that it will incentivize performance, we think that for a subgroup, as a second layer of, uh, of rebuttal, failing students are worse off. So what you're doing is you're using layered rebuttal to counteract the idea that there is benefit. Now, you could go even further and you can say that, well, even if we assume that the policy had a positive motivation, uh, Motivational force, poor students are often limited by their willingness to study. They are limited by other economic reasons. So basically what you're saying is we are countering the, prop, the, the assumptions the proposition has made. We're saying, well, incentivization is affected by a multitude of other factors, and you can't draw this kind of simple causational link that I give you more money, I instance, and that's in the form of the benefits you get for your family. Therefore, you would incentive, be incentivized to study. The argument here then becomes problematic because I'm suggesting, well, there are other factors. So this set of things that I've shown you, one, two, and three, are all about layering so that the rebuttal gains in depth. So that that's one of the examples that we'd like to bear in mind. The example of layered rebuttal is about not just stopping, not just repeating the same thing, but having statements that deepen the perception of the subject, deepen the perception of why the argument from the other side won't work so that you can push on. Okay, so, but you may ask, so how do we get to this part of brainstorming to layer rebuttals? And I'm going to suggest some methodologies for you. So I know that's always quite difficult when we are sitting in perhaps an impromptu situation or even in a prepared motion situation and you're sort of thinking okay what are the ways in which i can consider rebuttal how am i going to come up with rebuttal points that we can all talk about uh, as the debate progresses so here are some principles for us to consider first and foremost ask the heuristic questions so the heuristic questions are the five w and the one h question so that's the five w and the one h question so it's the who what when where why and how so in order on the screen why who when how, what, and where. So some, let's look at some of these questions. First, you may want to ask if someone proposes an idea. In this case, let's look at the motion about benefits and giving children uh, additional benefits for a good academic performance. You may ask, is, why is the opposite true? So you want to ask big heuristic questions of yourself. You may want to ask a question about the actor who or, and other actors who else is affected by the policy. That will also give you um, some degree of space. It'll allow you to see uh, what is happening. You might want to ask, when does the policy cause harm? So this is about a time and a placement question that you ask in order to produce layered rebuttal. From this question of the when, as much as the question of the who and the why, you might be able to find a way to create a rebuttal. There's also the question of how. 
And you can ask this question, how does the policy or how does the argument play out in the real world? So this is not just the theoretical suggestion of the debate, well, of the argument, for instance, where we're talking about our 2020 motion, which is about whether or not we should be giving benefits, uh, be extra benefits based on economic performance. We want to ask, how does it happen in the real world? Theoretically, perhaps as part of a thought experiment, it sounds like a nice idea, but what happens in the real world? So you might want to ask questions. If I put it in a particular community, how will this community respond? How will the family respond? So what are the real world scenarios that we could use to create rebuttal? That's part of brainstorming to create the rebuttal as well. Next, a question is the what question. What actually happens? as a result of this policy. So the how and the what are linked because by asking how does it happen in the world, you'll be able to then work on the results and ask yourself, what is the results of this policy? And finally, where does the policy impact people? So this is about knowing the nuances of the policy's application. In this case, we were talking, for those of us who've just joined, we're talking about a motion where we are trying to find ways to rebut a discussion about whether or not families get added benefits for, for uh, welfare benefits if children do well in schools. So by asking this methodology, using this methodology, heuristic questioning, you would be able to come up with more layered rebuttal. Okay, let's look at the second methodology. The second methodology is basically uh, imagining the counterfactual. And imagining the counterfactual means that what you are looking at is the version of the world that's been suggested to you by that side, by your opponents, and then ask in the counterfactual, counter to that world that they've suggested, what would the things be like? So this is an imaginative act that you would be doing with your team. So first, for instance, perhaps one of the things that you would do is you would ask about the narrative that comes from the other team and how it plays out in the real world. So you notice the how will it pl play out in the real world in method one, which is asking heuristics, turns up here again. So some of the methods will uh, produce thought that overlaps. But what's most important is we remember that we try to think in different ways to generate thought, to generate rebuttal, rather than being stuck by thinking only in a small and, and a sort of sectored way. Here is method two, which is imagining the counterfactual. So you ask the question, what's the narrative like? So a narrative, of course, in the debate is the story that you tell. In this case, it would be the story about the child. It will be the story about the way in which the pressure on the child, for instance, from the opposition point of view, uh, would produce counter perspectives of performance in school. So you really want to ask what is the counterfactual. Then as a furtherance to this idea of the imagined counterfactual, you want to ask, do you think that in the world that, the, that we are proposing, the world that will turn up, will individuals act in the way that the opposing team suggests that they will? Or are there other reactions possible that have not been part of the consideration of the team? So this is part of your assessment, both of the factual and the counterfactual, so that you are very clear that you know, you, if you disagree, then you know why you are challenging. And equally, I'd also like to suggest that the idea of narrative and storytelling is very important because debates aren't just about statistics. Debates are about persuasion. And persuasion is about telling the story. So sometimes it's useful to ask, is there another story to be told about the welfare situation? Is there another story that we can told about dignities of individuals and how young children or school-going children should not be made to feel indignified because they are suddenly bearing adult weight in, in terms of the labor that they have to do uh, to support a family. So these are all ideas that we can generate when you start to use the counterfactual imagination as another methodology for rebuttal. Okay, I'm going to move on to a third method, and you can see all of it's going to link. The third method I'm going to suggest to you for deepening rebuttal, because today's a lecture is about how to brainstorm and how to think about layered rebuttal so that you become more dynamic in the way that the debate is being managed uh, in terms of the rebuttal that you offer. So thinking in domains is something. Now, a domain is loosely a sector 
or a particular sectionality or particular grouping that you can start to think about in. But I think we forget when we are sitting and waiting for um, ways to create rebuttals that sometimes rebuttals can be very easily broken down. So in this case, you can think in domains in the following way. You can ask yourself, how will the policy that's being suggested affect the individual? So that's a very, very simple question you may think, but you'll be surprised how if we sat and talked about not just a single actor, but the idea of individuals as a domain or a section or a group, then we may get more um, diverse answers about how it will affect the group as the individual is concerned. Next, you may want to ask, how would this in a domain affect the larger society that individuals a part of, and this again will allow you to ask questions about whether or not there is one type of group that will end up becoming the recipient of this welfare benefit that we're talking about. Will there be labeling? Will there be a negative perception? Will there be gaslighting of that particular community by society at large. So all of these are very important things to ask if we want to build layered rebuttal. And of course, it's important for us to ask this question. Out of the society and the sort of like ambit of the smaller nas national base of society that we're talking about, will this policy affect the international community? Perhaps on a discussion like welfare and welfare benefits, the limitations about whether or not this is a debate mostly uh, restrained to the individual nation or whether or not it affects the individual community uh, is, of course, something you have to decide in the debate. But using the method of thinking in domains, inevitably you will end up thinking about the international community and whether or not that becomes an important domain that has been left out and rebuttal. And so you need to think about it. So what then are we going to do with all of this rebuttal? So I'm going to move now from this idea of rebuttal to the idea of table action. And that's very important. So if in rebuttal, we talked about all of these methodologies of thinking, the question is, why do we do it? Because that is part of table action. And debates, unlike public speaking, are highly dynamic because you are going to be responding to someone else. That's the function of both the uh, rebuttal section and both of the points of information section. So that in world schools, particularly, and also in British parliamentary, that is a strategic action that needs to take place. And table is something important. So what is table? The, the table literally refers to the set of speakers and the downward flow of the material on table action. So the table action or the table attack is the coordinated effect of all three speakers. If it's in BP, it's your two speakers, but it's the coordinated effect of all of these speakers across the table, the, the match positions you're in, and how you attempt to take down the case of the other side. So it is not about just the individual performance that you engage in because you are individually uh, rebutting, but it is knowing that there is a systematic and cogent, organized attack that needs to take place. So let's talk a little bit about this. Okay, so what are the parts of table attack so that we are very clear? The first response to arguments by both first opposition and second proposition. Why do I say it's first opposition, second proposition? Obviously, the first proposition speaker is going to make a constructive argument. They would be giving and taking points of information, but they are not actually rebutting because they are moving and laying out the heart of the proposition case. So the first response has to be to first up. So first opposition speakers do need to know what they plan to rebut and why they are doing that. That's part of their table action. Equally, the first responsive speaker from the proposition side is second proposition. So first proposition has laid the case. Second proposition must respond to first opposition. So first opposition and second proposition are first responder speakers. They are the first out to say things. So it's important that whatever rebuttal layering that you do, you also understand which rebuttal is going to be used where and why you're using it. That's super important. Now, we will have, as we go down the table, Extension material, so material that is used to extend the debate. The language is from British parliamentary debating, but the principle is the same. So you've set up a first or a second argument in your 
opening speaker, then you are extending by providing other arguments. So these must be attacked as we go down the table as well. You can't just say, well, we did a very good attack at the top and then we'll ignore, we won't. So we do need to have table action taking that into consideration as well. The evolution of your pre-made rebuttals and your continued response to your opponent's defenses is also quite important. Uh, what does this mean? So maybe you've come into the debate and you've already decided you, there's a certain kind of issue that's definitely going to turn up because it's inevitable and you've made that rebuttal and you've sort of planned that rebuttal but table action is also about looking to see whether the response that you made at the start is good enough or it needs to evolve based on the material that the other side has given you and that is part of the way in which you attack in order to sustain and to show that you are engaging in the debate and not merely being static. Remember, as I said to you, the most dangerous thing to be in debating is static. That means every speech looks the same because the speech is not responding or the speakers or are not responding to the other side. So something to bear in mind. So the last part of table attack, I would suggest to you is the, the strategic criticism of the opponent's policy and case that we need to make. So constantly in the debate, you need to understand what you are attacking and why you're attacking. But more importantly, it's useful as a debater to be able to tell the adjudicator, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing the following things. It's important, please watch. Because adjudicators like to have what one can term as signposts. So, you know, if you take a map or you look at a GPS and the GPS coordinates tell you where you're going, normally, you know, it asks you to punch where you want to go to. And then from there, it starts to give you the minutia, the bit by bit direction. So that's part of what you're doing in strategy. You are not just attacking, but you're telling us why the value of your attack is important and therefore adjudicators ought to look at it. So all of these things are part of table attack. Okay, so what, however, makes up good table attack? Because I can give you the idea that table attack must take place, but how do you do it? And what is good table attack? Okay, so good table attack would be some of the following things that I'd like us all to bear in mind. So first, that you have summaries and rebuttals to every part of the other team's case, not just um, every part in a loose way, but by every part, I mean, you have grouped the summer and summarized and labeled for us so that we know that you are responding to certain specific parts of the case in the way that you think as a speaker, the priority is important. But remember, as I told you earlier, there are three speakers on your team. So all three of you need to know which direction you're headed in. Second thing you need to do is for good table attack, you need to flag out. And flagging is literally like holding a, a, a small a piece of a well, small tiny table flag if you want to, or even a post-it note. Uh, mentally, that's the image you should have. You're holding up the note saying, see, look here. Look here, this has not been done. Look here, they failed to do that. So, so this is about flagging when the other team is failing to respond to an attack or from an argument from your other side. And good table attack also involves this, consistent evolution of the of rebuttals down the bench. And remember, the down the bench principle is about the layered rebuttal. That's why when we began the lecture, I started with the idea of the layered rebuttal, because by starting with the principle of layered rebuttal, you know that you need to use it, you need to employ it. And that's the, the thing that's going to allow you to evolve the rebuttal because you will have things to say. Because once you start to think about the three methods, asking heuristic questions, second, imagining the counterfactual, third, looking at the idea of domains. From there, you will always be able to find some material that you will be able to rebut. There's not going to be a situation where you will sit and say to yourself, or you say, I have nothing to rebut. That, I would like to suggest to all of us that sometimes when we don't know what to rebut, that's because we're not forcing our minds to think in patterns. And good layered rebutting comes from learning to think in patterns and to move methodically from one uh, strategy to the next in order to make the answers valuable so that the good table action is interlinked with the idea of being able to generate rebuttals in a positive way. Okay, so, how do we know 
there is coordinated table attack. So what do I do as a debater to make sure my team and I are coordinating so that we are applying more pressure on the other side? So if you look at this, if you, you just want to think of it this way, what you want to do in the debate is you want to be able to show gradually that the, that the opponent's case is disappearing, that your case is starting to dominate in the, in the debate because of the questions you are asking or the way in which um, you are perceiving that particular world and picture building that's happened. So one, one of the ways of a coordinated table attack is to remember to do the following things. Everybody in the team needs to make some kind of decision about that narrative and also about the way they're going to characterize people. So I think that often, I think we've all been in debates where we suddenly reach a point and realize, Oh dear, the way that my first speaker talked about uh, a particular actor, let's say going back to our debate about children on welfare and about whether or not their good academic performance should be allowed the family then to have more benefits in terms of welfare. So what is our characterization like about the child at the start of the debate, this child in school, and what is the characterization like at the end of the debate? So this is something that we need to bear in mind, the qualities of coordinated table attack. So remember, there is table attack, which is just attacking. That's good. But a rigorous and coordinated table attack gives you more ways of demonstrating that you're working well together as a team. And one of that is about being, as I said, consistent with the story you're building, consistent with storytelling, and being consistent with characterization, particularly of significant actors and significant players that you want us to look at. Same way, I think that this again, you see, it all interconnects as we go along. Call it the qualities of coordinated table attack also mean that the additional layers of rebuttal that we provide at the back end of the table, that means as we go down the table after first responses, we need to intensify the level. So we don't rebut one thing, leave it behind, but we try to keep it going by responding and showing that we are increasing, notching up the, the ways in which this particular arena can be viewed and therefore there is more intensity to the arguments that we're going to suggest. And coordinated table attack also means what we are doing as we go down the table is we're making very clear the difference between the logic we've made in rebuttals made by yourself as the speaker holding the floor and the other speakers. So you see the thing is if at every stage the rebuttal is being made, but the rebuttal is being made with the same words, but with the same logic that the first person who made it, makes this argument and rebuttal response will get the credit on, on the judge's ballot. Then after that, the rest of the team looks, again, that magic word, they look stiltified, they look static, they look stagnant. So what we want to do is to make sure that we are very clear that we are make, adding logic layers and saying that, well, my first speaker already told you this, now let's move on as part of my uh, continued response to the other side, here is another layer. So I, we want to use words like furthermore, moreover, and these kinds of words create accumulation. It suggests that you are doing things in order to intensify, but also to make sure that very clear, clearly that there is a consistency and there is a flagging. All right, now, how do I do these things in a speech? I'm sure that this is one of the things that all of us have asked ourselves. It's very well and good to be told these are a, a set of theoretical things you need to do, but what do you do in a speech? Okay, so here are some suggestions for all of us. And th these suggestions will also be uh, followed by uh, some examples that we can look at so that we can uh, sort of like concretize these ideas. So first, first steps you can do, you can flag dropped arguments. So the point of this is what can I do in a speech to, to make sure that I'm attacking? What can I do in a speech to make sure I'm showing that I have coordinated table uh, uh, processes? I can flag. So flag dropped arguments. What are dropped arguments? Dropped arguments are arguments that have appeared. Perhaps the first speaker of the proposition said this, but then by the later speeches, they seem to have disappeared. And then, you know, you need to point out, especially if these were important things. So you can explicitly state what argument was not responded to. So if your arguments are ignored, you need to say they're ignored. And 
you have to make it such you have to think why would the other side drop this argument that i gave them when especially if there was time to answer this and you need to make make sure you point out what the value of your argument some teams want to call it uh, why it is it is a, a winning point or why the point has weight in a debate but whatever it is you want to be able to point out how the dropped argument or the unresponded matter is significant and you also need to make sure you block out any attempt in table action through table action before later speakers to suddenly come back and say, see, especially if it is the back end of the debate and you have no more time and no more opportunity to respond as a main substantive speaker. So you wanna be able to also say why when a argument has, has disappeared, why it it's too late for someone to say they want to revive it. And if they do revive it at a later stage, that it is part of good table action to point out why that revival is problematic to this particular debate. Okay, so if we go from there, let's look at a motion and let's try and see whether we can put some of these into uh, practice. So I'm gonna walk us through it. So this think time will be, uh, sort of like mitigated by the fact we're going to talk to each other. But so this house would ban cars. You sort of think, okay, fair, sensible motion. Ban here applies to the idea of, you know, do away with the easiest definition, uh, uh, disallow by law. And car, I mean, clearly this is about the automobile and what we can do with the automobile. All right. Okay. So let's say we have the following argument that's made. So this is going to be an exercise of our unresponded matter and how we can call it out. So, all right, so step one, what we want to explicitly do on a motion about banned cars is you want to explicitly state the argument that was not uh, responded to. So maybe your language could so say something like this, or maybe you can articulate your ideas in this way. You can say the opposition failed to respond to my first speaker's second argument about how banning cars helps the environment. So in this what you have done very very clearly is you have pointed out what has not been talked about and that is important because you are flagging something that has been left untouched by the other side okay then what can you do you can work this principle about why the drop to material is so valuable and why it is a debate winning argument and the fact that the other side has refused to respond to it that makes it very problematic for them. So, and also strategically, it is something that is unfavorable to them. You want to point these things out. So how could you do that? So perhaps we had this. Given that climate change is an existential threat that can cause thousands of deaths through natural disasters and cause billions in property, then failing to deal with it will lose them this debate. Okay, so maybe in this statement, we have uh, some logic problems because we are somehow linking the climate change phenomenon to the car and the catalytic converters on the car. So as a, perhaps as a speaker, I'd need to make those links as to say the car and the kinds of uh, emissions from cars adds considerably to climate change. Climate change in and of itself is an existential threat. Therefore, this was an important argument because of cost as well as damage to property and natural disasters. We think they need to deal with it or it will lose in the debate. So what we're doing is we're trying to show the value of the original argument. And then we are trying to point out exactly why, if that original argument was unresponded to, what you will then have is a consequence which is egregious, which is extremely consequential and therefore the other side by evading this discussion is moving away from a point that ought to give you a space in the debate to claim that well i'm winning okay what else could you do for unresponded matter so what i said you can tell the judge but the next speaker it's too late to revive the argument so it's as simple as saying by second opposition speaker it'll be too late to begin responding to these harms you have to give the issue and you have to give this argument to proposition team. So these are simple modes of flagging. This kind of flagging allows you very much to be able to say to someone, well, I disagree, but here is my methodical steps by which I'm disagreeing. So I'm not merely just saying, oh, they didn't say this. They didn't respond to us. I, I, we want to go a bit further than that. We want to have a, a little bit more weight to what we are arguing. 
Okay, so what now can we talk about? So we've talked about drop matter. The next thing we're going to talk about is evolving cases. I'm sure all of us have been in debates where we realize that suddenly the teams that we are against are slowly changing uh, the, the way in which they perceive the debate. It's starting to evolve. That's the word that tends to get used. So what do we do? The first set of things that I've spoken about is about dropped matter and how to deal with that. Now we're talking about the evolving case and what can we do with an evolving case and how can we manage that? So here are some steps for you to consider as part of table action and as obviously as part of the holistic strategy of response and rebuttal. Okay, first for evolving arguments, you look and you ask, what part of the original argument is gone because people have changed it. So then you call out and very nicely, but firmly point out that the original argument seems to have disappeared. That's quite important because if a particular team flagged it as important to them at the start and now it's disappeared, then I think that there is a space for you as a speaker to say so. Next, you need to make the strategic critique or criticism that this argument now counts in your team's favor. Because you see, if they drop something, that must be linked to whatever you've done. And what you need to do is point out that they gave up an argument because of whatever questions you ask. So that, that therefore means that this argument now becomes favorable to your team and the work that your team has done on the table. The third thing you can do is attack the new version of the argument as if it were a new argument. That's super important because you can't really say, well, you gave us an argument in the earlier part of the debate now, that seems to have become something else. I'm not going to deal with it. It is important to show that you are evolving, that you are responsive. So the point is this, an evolving case must not result in the opponent becoming withdrawn from the debate. The opponent must keep showing engagement because the function of rebuttal and the function of good table attack is to show that you are engaged and that engagement is part of uh, the way in which you are trying to keep the upper hand in whatever is happening. So let's have a look at this motion. So the motion is this house supports affirmative action. This house supports affirmative action. So let's just give ourselves a couple of minutes to look at the motion, a couple of seconds, beg your pardon rather. So affirmative action here implies, of course, uh, to sometimes to the policy that's known as positive discrimination, where what you want to do is you are identifying a community or a, a, a hitherto neglected group or of individuals, or what you are doing is you are uh, identifying those who have been marginalized historically or marginalized because of certain attributions. And then you're saying, well, we will prioritize them and we will by uh, legitimizing this affirmative action, we're going to get to put into place policies that are going to give them more than others. And that's all right, whatever this might be, whether and whatever sectors this might apply to. So let's have a look at this. Okay, so let's say we have an evolving case on this house supports affirmative action. So first, let's do the call out the original argument as drop material example. So what does that mean? So this simply means you could do something like this. You could say, although the proposition team started out emphasizing misrepresentation in the workplace, this issue was missing by their whip speaker who instead focused on the principle of reparations. So here we have this challenge being made and saying, okay, at the start, you wanted representation in the workplace, but slowly you gave up this the argument. You no longer said that, you know, if we saw support uh, affirmative action, more people who have been disadvantaged and marginalized will then become equally represented in a workplace, allowing for more equitable presentations of, of workspaces in labor. Instead, you're saying they've given this up and now they want reparation, which is making up for damage done by due just returns. So what you are doing is calling out the section of the argument that is now disappeared from the debate. And that allows you to prove as a team that you are watching evolving cases. Okay, what about the next thing you can do? 
The second step that you can do with evolving cases is you can make the strategic criticism that that argument that has disappeared now counts in your team's favor. Now, how do we do that? You can say, this concedes to our rebuttal that affirmative action leads to tokenistic representation that enhances communities of color. Now, what does this mean? So you're basically trying to pull the argument that was dropped over to your side. You're saying, look, by doing this, you have conceded. You've given up important ground. You've passed it over to us, and you're saying that you agree with our rebuttal. And then what you do is you put in the rebuttal that you had, and you explain it a little bit more. In this case, perhaps an argument that could have been made is about that what you do is you flag for people that a particular community is under represented or that that particular community is in need of a leg up or need of state intervention to give them more uh, equitable advantages in society. And then we could say, well, that's not a good thing because you're flagging, you're flagging them out. You are in some sense, putting them under the spotlight and that may lead to more harms rather than the goods that you think you're going to achieve. So again, what you're doing is you're pulling arguments over onto your side. How about a set? Step three. The step three is to attack the new version of the argument as if it was a new argument. So let's let's point out. So we started out by saying, okay, maybe you wanted uh, representation in the workforce, and that was one good reason for this house would support affirmative action. And then by the end of the debate, the claim we're making is that part of the debate has disappeared, and now it's a discussion about reparations. So maybe you need to say furthermore. Again, you see labels and flagging, but also what you have is uh, argumentative modifiers, words like furthermore, additionally. So these argumentative modifiers link and move the argument along and show the, uh, the adjudicator that what you have is a good schematic idea of how the debate is moving. So you may say, furthermore, even reparations are not truly achieved as those benefiting from affirmative action are not often the poorest among communities of color. So again, we're saying, well, you know, the reparations you suggest might be distributed in such a way that the persons who are most in need at the lowest tiers of the need ladder will be left out. So what you're getting is by this kind of step-by-step -step attack of the evolving case, you are showing that you are strategically aware of the ways in which your opponents are moving the material and the ways in which your opponents have used the material in a clumsy fashion, or maybe sometimes it happens without their knowledge. They, they have forgotten what they started with and they've moved away. Or strategically, they've decided, maybe I need to just give up that argument because you've attacked it so strongly. But what we need to do as part of table action is to demonstrate that we have become aware of these things. And by demonstration, we will be able to show the outcomes. Okay, now, layering rebuttal. So I'm going to now move on to just Going back one more time to layering rebuttal as part of table action. We started with that. We just want to finish with this as well, just to remember. So we've been able to talk about dropped material for good table action. We've talked second about the idea of uh, the evolving case. Now we're going to back, bring back the idea of layered rebuttal as part of the good table action. So what must be... Do. To further lay rebuttals, I want to reinforce for us that what we must do is we must not let rebuttals that started with our earlier speakers disappear. And we need to respond and reinforce. I would like us to think about this as a quite an important thing. To respond is to reinforce. Just try and remember it that way, because that then allows you to show what parts of the debate have not been responded to by the other team. And what we can also do is continue adding further angles as part of good table action that will put a, a lot of pressure on the other team to respond. What we can do is say, all right, we've done the following things, but let's look at it from other points of view as well. But bearing in mind that we never want to contradict ourselves. Okay, That's super important. Contradiction is something that we must guard against because it produces weakness in our own uh, action. So let's have a look at this debate.
motion in order to get us into this last section about layering and the layered re rebuttal as part of table action. So thinking for a moment, this house would ban cosmetic surgery sometimes. It, these days, this topic is aesthetic surgery, same idea, the idea that you're not doing it because of uh, it's, it's medical intervention for non-crucial things. So it is not about intervention, it's surgery that is for crucial medical outcomes. So this is aesthetical. Right, so layering rebuttal. So let's have a look at that. So one of the things you could do is you could, the first thing I said to you is the idea of the reinforcing of the rebuttal. So what you want to do is make sure that you use the way that you present the argument and present the rebuttal. Uh, you want to align it to show that what has happened is you are reinforcing period previous speakers, and you're particularly responding to the fact that the other team has not done its job uh, in terms of this uh, strategic need. So maybe you have something like this, and the, the, the articulation you want is to say, the proposition's first argument about raising beauty standards was already engaged with by my second speaker. So this is uh, clearly you are at the back end of the table. So the proposition's first argument about raising beauty standards was already engaged with, with my second speaker, who told you that those getting cosmetic surgery were not the most beautiful, but the least. The lack of challenge of this counter characterization loses them this debate. So what does that mean? I mean, this, this, this basically means you're suggesting that people getting this uh, cosmetic surgery are those who have a dire need because there are perceptions of self that are affected. It's not just about those who are the most beautiful, perhaps the other side has made that claim, but what you are doing is you are making a different claim and suggesting that it is not about that, but rather about self-image and the idea of our own perception of how our standards of beauty are when we look in the mirror. And so therefore there might be a gradation. And this is the those in at need at the bottom of this gradated layer of those who want uh, cosmetic surgery. So you, you do need to point out what gets dropped and what is being reinforced. Equally, as step two, as I point out, we could add further angles of rebuttal to what has already been said. So that's equally important. You could say something like, furthermore, given that society would still uh, see the same things as beautiful, legalizing or, or making cosmetic surgery financially and practically accessible would allow individuals to live comfortably within these uh, global within these beauty standards. Now, that's quite important, you could argue, because it's a, it is a furthermore argument. Sometimes it is a moreover argument. You are extending and, and you're adding more angles and you're saying, well, it's not just my perception of beauty, but it's also the fact that I already perceive myself as not uh, at, the, uh, at, at the top of the ladder of perception of beauty, but rather I am marginalized by my own perception and I'm at the bottom and therefore I'm in need of the surgery, you're now pointing out that socially within the ambit of societies that are discussed, perceptions of beauty may not change. And because these perceptions of beauty are not changed, individuals may require the cosmetic surgery in order to allow themselves to find comfort. So there's the element of the psychological, the element of this, this ease emotional and affective ease with which we can manage everyday life in, in, a, in a situation where beauty has already been predetermined as it will. So I'm adding an angle. So what I'd like to suggest to us is that the adding of the angle is something that's part of layered rebuttal. You're not contradicting yourself. You're not undoing what your prior speakers have said, but what you are doing is you're adding on to show that part of table action, that your table action is, um, that which is accumulative, and you're also showing that the judge needs to see that the table action has been meaningful because at every point you are adding weight to the debate. Okay, so how do we improve at rebuttal? I'm sure and at table action. First, I'm just going to say this. We all know that practice makes perfect. So in some sense, you just have to keep trying it and trying it in different ways. Second, I would suggest we all be patient with ourselves. Improvement doesn't come overnight, but what you need to do is do perhaps the following things. One, continue debating, inspiring, and listening to the feedback from your coaches and from your peers. So sometimes even if your coach isn't there and you're just doing peer-based a rebuttal, it's a good place to be because it allows you to comment on each other's work. Second, 
you can do drills based on videos and with teammates. So let's say you don't have another team to spar with. There are lots of videos available online which have good matches. And what you can do is always you can use those uh, videos because, for instance, if you look at a motion and you decide you are going to be the one up, then the video provides you with the one prop speech. You rebut that. So it allows you to practice at least the fundamentals of, of all the things that we have talked about. And of course, watching the uh, live debaters debate live or debate uh, on screen also allows you to see how they layer their rebuttals. And you can watch the way in which they are schematizing and systematizing the movement in rebuttal. And that will give you your own confidence. So. With that, I've come to questions and answers if there are any, but what I'd like to say to you all and to encourage everyone is that layered rebuttal and strategic table action are all part of what makes debating fun because that's where you get engagement. And every match that you do, you will learn something more. And because you will learn something more in every match, progressively, you will find you are always improving, even though you sort of think when you first start doing it that, uh, well, I'm not as good as I ought to be. But the thing is, it all comes with practice. And so with that, you will be able to acquire a set of strategic awareness that uh, you will then be able to use because as you do more, the experience gives you wider ways of which to perceive the, the flow of debates. And then from there, you'll be able to use the methodologies that I've suggested, thinking systems that you can use as well as rigorous working with teammates in order to produce a consolidated way of attacking as well as responding to argumentation so that at the end of the day, you are making the most of your ability to uh, strategize the win for yourself. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions if anyone has one um, or wants to ask anything. Um, yeah, just in regards to time management, it's important yes. to basically prioritize what points you're going to engage with more than another, right? But how do you actually decide what point needs more engagement? Okay, thank you so much, uh, Olivia, right? Thank you so much, that's a, a really great question. I think that one of the things that happens as you do the debate is you will start to see that some issues are more important than the other. And these are the big issues because the other your opponents have decided that that is where their, their winning um, strategy is being placed. So for, for instance, if, some, if a team tells you and you watch when they are debating that they have making a lot of a particular argument and they have a lot of causal links to that in that argument and that they are also anchoring it. And if you look at the clock, you realize that they've spent a lot of time as part of constructive action. You need to know that you have to get rid of this argument as soon as possible. So strategically, it needs to go up. I agree with you that you need to know how much time, but this is not something that uh, I can broadly say to you, do this because it's dependent on the debate. But what you want to do is ask yourself firstly, which of the arguments must be taken down first? Because if you left it there, it's the most dangerous, that needs to go up. And that will give you a strategic flow. Then if you are a speaker at the, at the later part of the debate, you need to ask and watch what your teammates are doing to see whether they have angled the debate correctly. If you need to counter angle the debate, then you need to ask yourself, how much time do I need to move in order to realign the debate, to get it to go where it needs to go. If I don't have to do that, and they've done all the work correctly or in the way that we've agreed, then you have to ask yourself, what are the points of reinforcement that I want to do? And where are the points of extension that I need to engage in for the rebuttal? So that's how you make your decision. It's a balancing act of asking the question, which is the most dangerous thing? And at this point in the debate, must it come down? If so, it has to go high on priority. And so it's got to be the first thing. And you need to look at the time split to make sure that that split of time nonetheless leaves you enough time to do the other work, especially if you have some substantive material that you need to deliver. You've got to get that out as well. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Happy to answer anything else if anyone uh, has anything. Uh, 
otherwise, uh, thank you very much for having had me and uh, to, to be able to do this lecture was a pleasure. And I'm happy to answer questions that anyone might have at any other time. Thank you so much, Gita. No worries. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we'll see you next week at the next workshop. Oh, um, there's okay. a question. Oh, so sorry. Chat. Yes, I just saw the question. Apologies. Are these strategies applicable to robot characterization? Yes, they are. Because characterization refers to the way in which we perceive um, a entity, a event, a actor. And characterization refers to the language we are applying in order to identify the, the traits or the phenomenon that we would link to this particular characterization. So yes, the same principle applies. What you do is you ask yourself who the same heuristic questions you ask, who is the character? What is the character doing? Where does this particular um, set of features apply that the other side claims is part of characterization? How will this work in the situation of the everyday? What is the way that the characterization interacts with other actors and other features? So yes, you can use the same methodologies. So thank you very much. Have a great uh, afternoon, everyone, and uh, a good week ahead. And thank you again, Debate Slovenia, for having me. You too, Gita. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.